One of the most captivating ways to infuse a home with character and intrigue is by decorating with treasures from the past. Today on Homeworthy, join us as we explore the stunning antique collections of three seasoned experts from a rural country home in New Jersey to a Victorian terrace home in London. Discover how these homeowners beautifully blend the charm of the past with modern elements to create truly inspiring spaces. Watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. Hi Homeworthy, um, welcome to my farm in Sharon, Connecticut. My name is Michael Trapp. Please come in. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. To shop items inspired by this and other Homeworthy episodes, be sure to check out the product links below for amazing furniture, accessories, and more. When I bought the house, the house had been abandoned for uh, nine years. And the whole farm had been abandoned and before then it had been there had been renters in it for quite a bit of time and so the you know the windows were broken there was a fire in the kitchen the ceiling that there was a kitchen there and the ceiling was all burned out um, people had stolen the, the copper pipes out of the walls and the wires out of the walls to scrap it to buy drugs or whatever i can't imagine um they they stole the front door which is really embarrassing but it's like you know that's just but nobody thought anyone would buy this and actually fix it up because it initially it had been a roadhouse um from the 1790s and it was tiny little rooms all over the place and there were rooms all above here so when I bought it, I thought I only wanted the barns. I wanted the barns for my warehouse. And I thought, this is great. So I fixed up the barn. I put a roof on it. You know, I poured floors. I made it really nice. It was really great. And I moved all of my stuff in it. And then I put a little lock on the outside of the door. And I turned around and behind me is this big white abandoned house that was, that the weeds are about 10 feet tall in front of it. And I thought, it's not a great look, nor is that actually looking very secure since I just put all of my goods inside the barn. So I thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll rent it. And so I started ripping out the walls up in here in these bedrooms. And there was a tiny staircase that you would fall to your death if you tried to go down it too fast that was over here. And, you know, it was, it was just, it was a nightmare. And I was pulling walls apart. And, and I thought, you know, this is stupid. I had four house, I had four houses in six miles. And I thought, you know, it's just too much. Everywhere I went, something was falling apart or something needed to be cut or something needed to be weeded. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, I will redo this. I'm going to make this my house. I'm going to move here. I'm going to sell the other houses. I'll be next to my stuff. So that's actually really easy. And I don't need all those tiny, horrible, little depressing rooms. I'm just going to rip them out and open it up. So it's two stories, double height in the, in the main part of this living space. I guess this is what I call a keeping room, which is, it's, it's keeping the um, living room, dining room, and a sitting room all kind of all together. 
Uh, I've got a, a fireplace here. I built it, but I installed an 18th century French mantle. It's from the south of France and it's limestone. It's Louis Seize. And it's kind of, things in the south of France were a little more provincial than they were sort of around Paris. So it's, it's a little more relaxed, a little simpler, a little nicer, a little friendlier. Um, I have my, there's a skeleton of a cat that came out of uh, a Chicago um, laboratory from the 1920s and a collection of Greek bottles here and a great big sea fan, which I love. It's kind of the color of bone. The walls are covered in, it's mainly um, Ming Swatow, blue and white plates. And they all came out of a shipwreck that was found off the coast of Sumatra. And they were made around 1540, 1560 for the spice trade. And Ming Swatow is just a low grade blue and white porcelain that the Chinese thought was completely inferior and that's why they thought they would send it to the Western plantation owners and trade for spices and um, it was kind of like their ironstone of the period. The small plates are Kangxi, which is a, it's early 18th century. The big medallions are done by a, a Scandinavian sculptor named Thornson. And it's, it's morning and evening are, the, are what the figures represent. There's uh, two chandeliers and they're Spanish, uh, mid 19th century. They're just kind of cool. And when they're lit, they're just, the, the light is really beautiful. They'll light the entire room in here. For the summer, I cover all my furniture in like uh, white linen and, and white. And I put down these Tuareg mats because it sort of makes it kind of cooler and nicer and a little more um, friendlier. And in the winter, it's all this kind of deep, brilliant red. So um, it's quite intense and quite cozy. Probably the oldest things in this room are these three bottles. They're Roman for second century BC. Um, they're I think they're called Elboria, um, which is the shape. And they have, you know, this, this guy's offering this guy, whatever's in this vase. And here's a couple of an archer, and this is a soldier, you know, with this staff. Everything's kind of old. Old doesn't make something valuable. It just makes it sort of, it is old, you know. Uh, I'm not so concerned about age as I am about beauty. And if something's beautiful, it's beautiful. It doesn't mean it's valuable. It doesn't mean it's not valuable. It doesn't mean that it has provenance or age or anything like that. It just simply is beautiful. And that's sort of what I always traffic in is beautiful objects. And I think, you know, I think dead weeds on the table are really beautiful for, you know, the their simplicity and their, you know, mother nature, I think it's incredibly beautiful. That's why I like the skeletons, because I think it's the, the structural part of what makes us is so fascinating. And I, I, I just think that beauty can be found, it's everywhere if you just look. And here's the dining room table. Uh, the base of the table is 16th century. It came out of a monastery. And the top is an 18th century floor out of the uh, central France. Actually, I came out of Montpellier. And I have a little tableau vivant here going on. This, this uh, pottery here is called Hispanomoresque. And these are 16th century. And the, the capitals are probably, you know, 15th and 18th century and the big pots Italian and it's 19th century. These are shipwreck pieces um, that I actually just bought. And it's, um, it's called Swan Kalat, but it's kind of the same period as um, uh, Song Dynasty. So you're talking about 
1400, 1300, 1400, um, and the, the corals just grew naturally. It's, they're just, they're just really, really pretty and beautiful shapes, simple shapes. And it's kind of nice to be able to find something so old that's been underwater for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years and still has, uh, it's still intact. The red beads are Tibetan and they're called malas. And they're in the Tibetan culture, they're handed down from mother to daughter. And so each, each strand of beads is made out of multiple beads from different generations and depending upon how many daughters you had and things like that. But it's this like great coral color. And there's always speculation on whether the the Tibetans just like that color or whether they actually trade it in coral because you do find coral in Tibetan jewelry. And what they think it is is that when the Himalayas were, you know, part of the seabed, there was a vein of coral that was found in there and that it, it when the mountains were rising, they found the vein of coral and they mined it. And after that ran out, they started making it because it's a, these beads are made out of a combination between like ceramic and glass. And the runner is uh, Kuba cloth from um, uh, the Congo. And it's, um, it's raffia that's appliqued and these kind of like great patterns. And they're really, really complicated to do, especially if you're dealing with uh, woven grass. And here's the living room. Again, I've just covered everything in white linen for the, the summer season. The skeletons are bottlenose porpoises, these smaller ones that are behind. And the big one is a pilot whale. Um, and that came out of a little museum in the Spice Islands in Indonesia. And they kind of just float beautifully in this space above the dining room table. And when I was installing this, I did it with my two assistants, Alyssa and Rachel. And I was just hell bent on uh, getting the whale skeleton up. But I kept running back and forth to the hardware store. And the woman in the hardware store is like, why don't you just tell me what you're trying to do? And I said, well, I said, you probably won't believe me. And she said, she's like, just try me. And I said, well, I'm hanging a whale skeleton above my dining room table. <laughs> she had never heard that one before. Um, and I'm sure she's still talking about it. But um, it comes all in pieces and it's all numbered. <laughs> so it's like, it's like putting a puzzle together. You know, you put, you know, number 29 is next to 30, next to 31, you know, and all the way down. And then it comes out that it's a whale. But it's fun. Because it's a long, basically it's a long shoebox, and I had this kind of space, and I also had just bought two whale skeletons. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll sell the one whale skeleton, and I know exactly where I can fit the other one in. So I covered the ceiling in uh, plywood, because I know it's going to be hanging a whale skeleton from it, so that um, it would stay up and not fall down on the dining guests below it. The floors in this room are, it's Belgian bluestone. It's 17th century, and it was, it was used as ballast during the spice trade in Indonesia. And what they would do is they would take the floors and they would fill the bottom of those like big clipper ships. And that would weight the, the ships down to hold the mass up. And then they would go from Holland to um, the Indonesia, to Batavia and Java. And um, when they got there, they would unload the stone and fill the ballast. They would fill the hulls with um, spices. And that would be the weight to get them back to Europe. And so when the stone arrived in Indonesia, it was a Dutch colony and they um, installed it in, you know, Dutch colonial buildings, a lot of which now kind of wound up on like military bases and things like that. There's not a lot of appreciation for colonial architecture. I've been buying it in Indonesia 
and shipping it back, but originally it comes from, from Holland. And the wood that is separating it is a wood called Ulin. And Ulin only comes from the island of Borneo. And it's a very, very dense, slow growing, hard wood. And it's so dense that it, it, it actually, it sinks. And it's one of the few woods in the world that actually still, that sinks because it's so heavy. But when you put it in salt water, it naturally gets this kind of uh, black patina. And this was removed from a 19th century English colonial house on the island of Borneo. And so I used it to divide the floors up and all that. And it just looks like it's been here for a thousand years. It's that castle look. You know, when people come over for the first time. The outside of the house is really deceptive. It looks like a sort of Connecticut farmhouse. It's by the road, there's a barn, it looks like a farm. It's got bushes around it and things like that. The interior doesn't relate to the exterior. So it's usually sort of surprising that people, they come in and then they're suddenly like in this space and then there's like this whole like you're in a whole nother world you're in some kind of like museum that you've just sort of like stumbled into i suppose the the best compliment is um someone bursting into tears because they think it's so beautiful it's the surprise and the inspiration that you want to that's the achievement when someone gets inspired, you know, and they, they can dream and they can imagine and um, it encourages them to like think differently and um, be who they are. You know, there's no right way or wrong way of doing anything. This is just simply how I like to do it. And I, you know, I don't recommend it for my friends, but um, you know, this is what makes me happy and that's why I do it. Now we'll go to the library. This is the old part of the house. Um, it's all sort of, it's all sort of old, but this is the part of the house that's um, intact, that was basically the same layout as when I bought it. Um, the walls had all been like overpainted and wallpapered and um, pretty ghastly. So I spent I spent months with a single edge razor blade scraping the ceilings and the walls down to like original paint colors, which is kind of cool. And then I tried to mix my own colors to sort of like bring those colors throughout the entire rooms. Um, and this is my library. This is the room where Betty lives. Betty's, Betty's taken up residence here. This is her assisted living. This is where I bring her food and water every morning and I give her her treats every evening. And according to Michael, my husband, she's the best brush cat in America because she gets brushed twice a day. Um, and she's, she's 17 years old and she's retired on her tuffet and she's very cute. Um, but it's also the library. Uh, I had the cases made by a cabinet maker I know in Jakarta. And it's all salvaged teak. And he builds things in a, the same way that they do in the, during the 19th century. Everything's dovetailed together. Everything's got chamfered backs. It's very classic um, cabinetry making. And he does a beautiful, beautiful job. Except... He built it for a square room and an 18th century house is in a square room. So the cabinets were all square, but the room isn't. So I had to buy like um, hacksaws and things like that and cut off the ends of the cabinets to actually fit them into the room. <laughs> but it's, it looks like it's been here forever. And it's, I like these, these like vitrines. It's a window in front of a window. When we were, little we lived outside of berlin and there was a house and they had winter gardens and this is just kind of a classic thing except the the germans would grow like geraniums in here and 
I just have my collection of skeletons in here. And here we've got another cat skeleton. And on the label, it says it's a skeleton, it's a skeleton of a tomcat. And then we've got fish skeletons and there's goat skeletons and a miniature horse skeleton and a French dog and a chicken. So we've got all kinds of things. And it's just, it's a really pretty room and it's, um, it's relaxing to be in here. The mirror came from my friend Brooke Hayward. I made them for her for her apartment in the city when they sold the apartment. They couldn't get them out. So, um, Sotheby's didn't want them. So anyway, I went and I got them. But I made them years before using um, old back bars out of Chicago and then just framing them with architectural moldings. So that they look good. They look nice and Again, part of my collection of um, dead plants, bushes that didn't make it through the winter. The chairs are French, 18th century, um, actually quite, quite nice and quite comfortable. It's a nice winter room to be in. It's nice to sort of sit here and, you know, it's warm, it's cozy, the morning sun comes flooding in, and I can hang out with Betty. So, this is Betty. This is Betty. She's a grandma. This is dropped off here 11 years ago by someone who said that she should be euthanized um, because I wouldn't have time to take care of her. And I didn't think that that was right to do. And I didn't think it was her fault that they were an idiot. So she's been here and happy ever since. I'm also, I'm a co-chairman for a local animal shelter that's based out of West Cornwall called the Little Guilds. And we've been trying to raise money to build a new shelter because the shelter they were in was a really decrepit ranch house that had been converted and added onto and really depressing and really hard to clean and hard to heat. And the, the volunteers are having a hard time, you know, keeping it maintained. And so, um, in order to raise money, I've done big party events here for them, and I've done garden tours in my garden in West Cornwall. And Michael, uh, my husband, has done, he's doing a, a horse jumping event in a couple of weeks, um, all to sort of raise money and bring awareness to them. And my cat Iris, which is at the shop, she came from. Uh, the Little Guild, and she's one of three cats I've had from the Little Guild, so I'm blaming everything on Iris that it's costing me a small fortune in all of these things <laughs> and time. Um, this is what I call the black and white room. Um, because there's two sitting rooms, it was just easy to make one a library, and this is really um, where Michael and I, we watch television. <laughs> So we spend a lot of time in here. And the, <laughs> the main feature in here is there's a giant frieze that was done by um, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney in around 19, late teens, early 20s. And she was a woman of means. The Whitney Museum is named for her. And she was also, she was quite a well-known sculptor and for a woman to be working in that medium at that time is rather unusual and it was only because she was so talented and she was also um, so wealthy that uh, she didn't get a lot of pushback but not a lot of women did that there's it's a set of there's three freezes and there's these this was two and they've been i've put them together to make one that fits, but they actually were made to go together. And it must have been so it went up a staircase or some kind of landing. And it's allegorical, I'm sure it's telling a story, but nobody in the family knows what the story is or anything about it. And these are plasters and they were made as um, an example of, but they were never cast in bronze because I don't think she got the commission. But they're rather extraordinary, and they're just beautiful. And it's sort of, 
Um, the fact that it's all nudes at that in the twenties was a fairly open-minded period, but still for the 1920s, it's pretty kind of um, frisky for um, that kind of thing. But it's great. I love the way that they're all kind of moving in that direction and looking in that direction. And the first figure, her elbow went outside of the frame. So I just cut a hole through the wall and um, her elbow's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> This guy was missing his arm, and he was missing the half of his arm on this frieze. And I did have um, a sculptor in Cincinnati um, make the two missing arms, which he did a beautiful job. I just need to get some uh, fireplace ashes to sort of color that up a little bit. When people come in this room, it's uh, they're not expecting this like life-size group of people to be up against the wall and it's sort of a little uh surprising and um but it's it makes you very intimate with it and i think that it's got a really powerful impact and i think it just sort of takes people's breath away and they're impressed by it but also there's something that people often laugh when they sort of see it because it's sort of like they weren't expecting it so it's good it's when it when you're watching television you're never alone <laughs> the frame photographs are my um old assistant rachel who does all my work for my website and she does also art photography and she does beautiful work the coffee table i had made in Indonesia by my friend Bing, who also made the bookcases. And again, it's using the Java, they call it Java stone there, but it's really Belgian blue stone. And um, it just makes a nice surface. The carpet is from Iran. It's a tribal carpet. The, the table in the corner is white marble and it's, 17th 18th century Chinese and it's probably it's just sort of folklore but um, white marble was reserved for the Forbidden City um, in Peking and so it would have been like a garden table or something like that from that again there's more pieces of um, shipwreck pottery that's kind of kicking around it's a hat from a whirling dervish um, from Istanbul, which is actually pretty cool. And this is mud cloth, and then is also from the Congo. And the, the curtains are from Bhutan, and it's a raw silk. And these are Buddhist um, monk shawls. And friends of mine in Ipswich used to travel to Nepal every year and there were Tibetan traders and traders coming down from the Himalayas um, trading in textiles and things like that. So for probably 30 years I've been buying these Buddhist monk shawls and I decided to make curtains out of them. But they're just, they're, they're really cool. They're, uh, they're sort of like beautiful. It's almost like a plum colored in this um, very sort of like natural color simple and nice um, and they feel nice and they have a nice fringe on them. And here's our kitchen. It's just been kind of made out of old parts and things like that that I had lying around. The windows are from the original house which I removed and put in nice insulated windows, but I, the windows were too pretty, so I decided to make the cabinets out of them. The walnut and the pine doors are old French armoires that I had pieces of, so I cut them up and made doors out of them. I've got a collection of Venetian glass, and I've got some big stacks of Danish plates that I bought in Indonesia years and years ago. Um, bits and pieces of uh, 18th and 19th century glassware. Most of the rest of the glassware is at the shop in West Cornwall. The walls are covered in French um, tile. It's called parfois, and it comes from the south of France, and it's this kind of blonde color. And it kind of looks like it's old cut stone, and that's kind of cool. The big doors in the pantry 
um, their old French doors that came out of a house that I worked on in the south of France. Uh, and it's sort of like it, it hides a multitude of sims. You know, you can, you can see there's like, there's snacks, stereos, there's a microwave, there's everything inside of here. <laughs> That's why we keep the door closed. Um, this is what you call a hearty orange and had two of them and I bought these years ago and had them in a bucket outside of my door in West Cornwall and obviously they died so um, they're not all that hardy but they're actually they're sort of more attractive dead than they are alive. <laughs> they have these kind of aggressive thorns on them which um, I had a wedding in uh, at my shop years ago and the bridesmaids were all getting entangled in these so I'm not sure I recommend it for uh, growing in a pot. Well, I think we should go to the terrace now uh, and I'll show you what's going on out there. This is the back terrace. It's sort of like there was a there wasn't really anything here when I bought it. So all of the stonework and the columns and all that kind of stuff are all um, part of it. But what was here that was so incredible is the land. The land here is exceptionally beautiful. And it's these very sort of soft rolling hills. And it's unlike any land I know of around here in Connecticut. And I grew up in Southern Ohio. And in Southern Ohio, there's an area that kind of looks like this. So for me, I can, it's a little like being in Ohio without really having to be there. And that's kind of good because my business is here. But I, I just find this landscape really, really beautiful. And this is called the Oblong Valley. And there's a plate that has like, Connecticut on it and a plate that has New York State and this is where the two plates have met and all the stones that way in Connecticut are all granite and all the stones that way in New York State are schist and New York is right on the other side of those trees so I'm really right on the border when I bought this house there was a there was this kind of terrible walkway in the front there was like old stones and one of the stones that I had sort of pulled up it was um, it was like an an old Indian. It must have been for like ceremonial purposes, for like grinding maize and herbs and things like that. There was like an oval sort of indentation and a round indentation, and then these scored like rings in it. And so I think this must have been an Indian sort of land or Indian encampment at some point, you know. The, way back time before the settlers came and the early settlers around here like 1730s because it's soft and rolling and there's not a lot of rock in it it would have been easier to farm and that's why i think the the indians were here and i think it's really their land that we're walking on i made the pergola and the these these stone columns i had carved in france um, I had copied an 11th century uh, sort of like colonnade that was behind a monastery outside of a little town called Bonnier at Saint-Hilaire. And they're just very sort of simple, gothic looking. And then my, my old assistant, Julien, found these in his village, which is in the Central Mastif in in south central uh, France in their early 17th century. But they're, they're great. They're kind of similar and they, they look good and they're the right proportion. I had to like make bases for them to like get them a little higher. And then I just took barn timbers and the original barn timbers are, were the timbers that I pulled out of the house to put up at the top. But I've had to replace them because they weren't planning on them to be outside for years and years and years. So. They've been rotting. <laughs> they had to like upgrade to oak. Um, the stone table I designed and I had 
carved in France. The chairs are 19th century Dutch colonial out of Jakarta. Here's another table I designed and I had made in France. Um, the benches are Dutch colonial. Everyone thinks that they're, often they think they're pews, but they're not really pews. They, um, in the tropics, it's so hot and they have big uh, open verandas around their houses. And in the heat of the day, they would go home and they would nap on these benches after lunch. And then they would get up after the sun started to go down and it cooled off and then finish their day at work. And um, that's in the 19th century, so. And here is, I love water and I love the sound of water. And one thing this property doesn't have is um, water. And I was born in Maine on the coast and I've lived on rivers and West Cornwall's on a river. But so I put in, I have water features. And this is my plunge pool. Um, so after work, it's nice to sort of like jump in and cool off and wake up and uh, feel refreshed. And it's also, it's just, it's nice to have like the little sound from the fountain kind of trickling through. The fountain is American, it's Art Deco, um, 1925, something like that, just simple cement. But it, I think just, I love that kind of just pure, simplistic, nice, quiet, easygoing. It's a very nice place to hang out. These big stones and things like that. It's, they're 19th century sidewalks out of New York State. And they're, they're like these big, great, cool stones. And um, it just helps to make it look like it's been here a long time much longer than it has been. This type of pruning is called espalier, and it's a, it's a French form of, um, everyone thinks it's tree torture, but the philosophy behind it is you remove, you remove all the excess, you keep the trees that are kind of growing in these like lines, and you keep them short and you also have the branches so that they come down slightly so that all the sap is actually running into the fruit and they use the french will pick off like a third of the fruit that um is on the tree so that the fruit that's left on the tree is better and bigger quality and this way it keeps air circulation around the fruit so it's just a much better product and the you know it not only does it look good, but it tastes good and it has a real, there's a real philosophy behind this. This is the backyard. It's a pretty backyard, but it's the backyard. And, and yes, I do um, hang my clothes and I dry them. <laughs> I hate um, using uh, clothes dryers and things like that. In the house, there were, there's only a few things that are, remnants of what was here before I bought it. And one of the things is the swing. And the swing came with the property. It's, um, it's quite nice. The, it's, it's on this maple tree, which I think is actually sort of um, a beautiful tree. It's unusual because it's, it's an ancient maple, but it's a miniature. And so it's grown quite small, but it has this like cool shape and that's, um, it's just nice and it's nice to sort of come out here and swing and when I have parties I also have like lots of people that are swinging back and forth and little old ladies picking up young men and things like that. So it's like, I'm not responsible. Um, but no, it's fun. It, and, and I've never thought of taking it down and I'm very happy that it's here and that the ropes haven't broken yet. So I'm not gonna test it. This land, sometime in the 19th century, they had filled this area to bring it up because there's wetlands back here. And this was a way of uh, keeping this area a little drier. That garage originally used to be somewhere around in here. So when I bought the property, the garage was in the front of the barn and then I got a crane and I moved it to the back of the barn. So slowly it's getting back to where it was. <laughs> originally, but I built all of these walls, or I had these walls built um, 
by the guys that work for me and they do a beautiful job and they look like they've been here a long time but it also it separates the mother nature's area which is on the other side of that wall to the the lawn area and the nice thing about the stone walls and the terraces, you know, the walls are big, but I just let the ivy grow on them and it kind of softens them and it makes them look like they've been here. They're, it's not so heavy with the masonry. It's got a sort of a more subtle approach to it. The benches also came out of um, central France, you know, and they're nice. There's 17th century stone, but they're, they're, it's good. And it's, it's a nice place to like sit and look back at the house and it's a good view. And um, my world is in the back and in, in the inside. And I leave the front looking more and more like Connecticut, like the rest of the road, not trying to draw too much attention this direction. <laughs> the field right now, it's kind of late summer and so you get goldenrod and you've got cattails. The tall stuff back there is Phragmites. That's a bad thing, but it used to be all the way up to here and I've been sort of cutting it back. So forcing it back and hopefully the cattails will like get rid of it. In my barn, I have barn swallows and they, they feed on all the mosquitoes and all the bugs that come out every evening and every morning and they just do this kind of like ballet of like swooping down and cleaning everything up and it's just it's really really nice but now there's like color um i started planting this 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 row of zinnias and cosmos and um sunflowers it's it's sort of um it's sort of like it's a Midwestern kind of gardeny thing. It, it, it takes me back to Ohio, but I, I rather like it. It's sort of like, it, it's kind of fun. The colors are a little shocking. <laughs> Since it's a farm, I decided to use things that one might find on the farm. So on the pergola, I've got grapes growing. Uh, I've made all my fences out of apple trees. And it's, it's again, it's it's beautiful, but it's somewhat appropriate for um, agricultural. <laughs> the upfront costs of doing a garden like this are high because it's all structural and it's all, um, they're all like things that are going to stay that way. And, but then maintaining it, there's not a lot of, the beds are, the beds are this narrow. I don't have time to get involved in like big gardening projects here. So I really, I've made it intentionally to be very simple and very easy to maintain. The boxwoods are pruned once a year. The apples are pruned twice a year. Um, it was a really good spring for the apples. And so a lot of them, a lot of them are heavy in fruit which is kind of good, um, you know, and there's probably six or seven different varieties. So I've got these, you know, it's nice. These, these look like they came out of the Wizard of Oz somehow. So. Um, they, were, they were rejects from a job that I did. So. Not only were the apples very prolific, it's a very good year for um, the hydrangea. They're, they're looking quite, quite robust for this season. So it's good. They smell nice. And basically gardening is a series of rooms and you move from one room to the next room, to the next room, to the next room. So this is like going um, up, a, uh, up a, a corridor. And here we have the other water feature. This one is for the fish. So I've got goldfish in here and I've got water lilies and the water lilies are in bloom, which is nice. And here I used a piece of 19th century bluestone, um, which actually was the floor of a prison in Massachusetts in like 1840. Um, but that's the bridge. So that's kind of nice and cool. The columns are Roman. 
and the bench I had um, carved in the south of France. It's very peaceful. It's, it's nice to sort of sit here. And when I'm waiting for someone to arrive, I'll often sit here because the sun will come in onto the bench and no one can see you and it's very peaceful. Um, the big pot is from Crete, um, 19th century. It was for olive oil. And, and then we have our more boxwoods. And I think we'll go and check out the bedroom. This is the bedroom. Um, well, this is this is our bedroom. This is where we sleep. And it's actually sort of one of my favorite rooms. I like this room very much. I love waking up here because I wake up and I look out and I can the, I look out onto the land and the field and it's a little like being at the sea because it, it's a, it looks different every single day and every single morning. You know, there's recently there's a lot of fog. And so it kind of like it drifts in like these fingers that kind of overlap through. And then, you know, sometimes you can't see the willow tree in the back pasture. And then as the fog burns off, you know, the silhouette starts coming and it starts exposing itself. It's also, it's at the back of the house, so it's quiet. And, you know, I've kind of layered it in lots of sort of um, textiles and things like that. The walls are covered in 18th century Ottoman um, ecots. And the carpet is 18th century from Anatolia. Um, the bed is a, it's a Dutch colonial bed out of Sumatra. And... Um, it came in this like this kind of wonderful uh, candy apple red color, which I think is really great. The driftwood, it's a piece of root from Borneo and it's teak and it was just weathered by being along a riverbed for years and years and years and years and it's kind of softened it into these kind of wonderful shapes. But it's one of those things, you know, when you wake up and you're having your coffee, you can kind of look at it and sort of see, you know, flames flickering or something like that. And the, the chest belonged to my parents. Um, it's part of my inheritance. Uh, but, um, and they bought it when they were first married. So it's nice. It, it, um, it actually holds a lot, a lot of stuff. And it's kind of, it's, it's made out of birch and it comes from a Chicago manufacturer, but, um, simple and sturdy and, um, you know, a little on the modern side, but it's okay, it's fine. Um, that, you know, I've got, it's a Turkish uh, perde I use as a headboard and that's that kind of like striped cloth and they're woven in strips and then they're sewn together. And originally in, uh, for nomadic people, they're moving their tents, you know, from place to place, and they use these as the walls in the tents to separate, you know, one space from another space. Um, and again, there's another one of those giant mirrors from my friend Brooke that I had made years ago, sold to her, and then I, they, they wound back in my um, hands, which is very good. And this is the bathroom and the. In here, I've covered the walls in 19th century teak from a house in Jakarta. And the floor is uh, an 18th century courtyard floor from China. And it's a, it's a granite and it has like a little bit of pink in it. Um, my friend Tom did the collages and I love his work. It's all throughout the house and it's in uh, West Cornwall as well. It's simple, it's nice, it works. These cabinets came out of um, a New York service kitchen, the old St. St. Charles cabinets. And I was offered them by some people who told me that they were going to throw them away if I didn't buy them. And I said, well, why don't I let you throw them away and then I'll just take them. <laughs> and then I offered to actually give them <laughs> half the money if I sold any, and I did sell some, but um, 
which is pretty good, but it's sort of like they think they're garbage unless they want to buy them. I thought that was an interesting sort of, you know, it's all those things. But I, I, it's, it's nice. There's a view of the terrace through the windows. The breeze kind of like blows through here. It makes a nice place to sleep and a nice place to wake up. And I wake up at five and I have my coffee for an hour in bed and I just start thinking about what I have to do during the day. And this is a nice, inspiring place to do it. So for a living, I actually, people ask me this all the time and I basically, I tell them I make people's dreams come true. I've been an antique dealer for a long, long time. I used to lot, do lots of antique shows all over the country and flea markets. Um, I've had a shop in West Cornwall since 1990. I studied landscape architecture, and it was in the School of Architecture. I went to Ohio State, and I really, really, really hated it and dropped out in my junior year. And I was, uh, I had been uh, doing tapestry weaving um, to keep my grade level up at, at that point, and I've always had a pension for textiles. And when I moved to West Cornwall, I did a garden there. And from that garden, people wanted me to do their gardens and their friends wanted me to do their gardens and on and on and on. So it was a, that's a, I do garden design and it's a business basically by word of mouth. I design furniture. Um, I salvage a lot of architectural things. I started doing that a long time ago, um, mainly because there were lots of beautiful things that were just getting thrown away, that weren't being appreciated. And you could find really cool stuff was, that was historically significant and was just being um, used as landfill. And I, it made me crazy, so I just started to like, you know, buy it at salvage yards and I would take it to antique shows and I would, you know, market it that way. And people would be like, oh, you know, this is really cool, but you know, what do you do with it, you know, when I get it home? And so in this house, I've used a lot of salvage things to show people, while well, you can do your floors, you can take, you know, old shutters and you can make the doors out of those. You can use the old windows to make, you know, cabinets out of them. You can use, you know, there's, it's, it's all recycling, but it's recycling with like really cool stuff, but it's also, it's saving the planet. And it's, it's just, it's smart and it's intelligent. It's also, you can't get this quality anymore. You can't get the quality of the wood anymore. It just doesn't exist because we've over harvested everything. And the, the few places that you still get old growth lumber, we should leave alone because it's helping save the planet. And the other, main business that I have now is garden design. So I also, you know, I do people's gardens and then I, I also dabble in architecture because it's all kind of the same to me. It's, it's all inside and outside and it's, the inside should relate to what's going on on the outside and it's creating rooms outside like you have them inside. It's the understanding of flowing from one space to another space. Um, and it should be, it should be interesting and it should feel seamless. And that's, it's basically, that's what I do. And that's what I try and do for my clients. And some people only know me for doing gardens. Some people only know me for an antique shop. Some people only know me for doing, you know, interiors. And I can do them all, but I, you know, it depends upon what the person wants. I can show you a bit of what I do because the antique side of it um, and sort of the salvaged architectural side of it is in the barn and is just outside the door. So let's go. One of the things that sold me on this property was the amount of cement that was here. <laughs> because I had a house in Falls Village and I had a stone yard there that was all gravel. 
and I have a forklift and the forklift was I was getting stuck in the gravel and getting a forklift unstuck is a really unpleasant task. So when I saw all of this cement here, I thought, this is a fortune. <laughs> this is great. This is mine. I want it. Um, so it really was. It was, it was. it was a big selling point. And it was a dairy barn. And so they've got these like graded things in the cement so the cows don't slip and you can wash it down with the hose. And there used to be a big like metal barn here that was a hundred feet long. But now this is what I, this is where I keep my stone. And I call it the stone yard. And it's sort of like, um, cause I do all kinds of projects and I need sort of, if you're doing a project, you need enough to like complete the project. When I find really cool old stones, I just buy them. And, you know, this is all 19th century bluestone that comes from New York State. And that's granite curbing. And that comes from uh, Connecticut. And it was, this curbing along streets is really what it is. There's a large pile this is the 17th century belgian bluestone this is all the flooring like is in the house it just doesn't have a polish on it so if you get it wet it turns into that sort of beautiful sort of like charcoal gray and some some pieces have like nautilus shells and brain coral and things like that in them you know there's a selection of iron bits you never know if you're going to need something at the drop of a hat um, the giant capitals, they came off a building in Washington, D.C., um, 19th century. You know, it kind of gives you an idea of how large the building must have been because those capitals are gigantic. And in the back there, it's that's pool coping. That's 18th century French, and it, it does a round pool. And it must have been outside of a kitchen because in some of the stones you can see where they've taken their knives and they've sharpened them for, you know, hundreds of years, you know, of sharpening the knives because it's a sandstone. Um, we have, there's American 19th century, rings like a bell, round tables, always important to know where your round tables are. Uh, rectangular tables, big tables, giant pots. The giant pots came out of um, the Vanderbilt Whitney um, studio. Uh, it, you know, those are really big Italian pots. It's for an estate, I suppose. Um, I've got cobblestones in the back. I've got another big stone table. This is half of a lychee tree. It comes from Indonesia. And it's probably one of the heaviest things that I've ever bought in my life. When I tried to get it out of the container, I thought it would come out. Then I had to get the forklift and chains and things like that and drag it. <laughs> but it's solid burl. Um, so if you ever wondered where lychees come from, that is where it is. Um, we've got bits and pieces. We've got French pots and big cauldrons, balusters from New Hampshire. This is the front of a bank. It's um, brown granite with uh, limestone capitals, rather pretty. These are from Java. Uh, they make nice fountains, slightly modern feeling. Uh, bases from uh, East Bali made out of uh, coral stone. And then we can go inside. This is really why I wanted to have this property. I thought it was beautiful, I thought it was wonderful, but the barn, Barns in Connecticut are few and far between because farming just sort of uh, went out in the early 20th century and there are not that many around and there's not that many barns left. And growing up in Ohio, there were a dime a dozen. So this is this wonderful space. This barn, this part of the barn, this is the big barn. 
is um, late 19th century. It's probably 1880s, 1890s. And the thing is, it's all cedar. You know, it's like an inch and a half thick cedar boards that make up the entire barn. And cedar now is like $10 a, a linear foot. So it's just, it's like a billion dollars worth of cedar. But, um, and I think they use cedar basically hygienic for hygienic reasons. Cedar, cedar, you know, it keeps moths out of your clothes and things like that. But I think it also has um, other purposes that maybe were good for dairy cows. In here, I try and keep it organized because I hate disorder and I have that kind of German military Midwestern background, which everything, you know, my father always said a place for everything and everything in its place. And so this section is filled with jars and they're jars, they're Tunisian jars and they're Peloponnesian jars and there's Portuguese and Indonesian and Balinese. These are, these are some corners from a, a the Roman for century. Here I have tiles. Um, there's encaustic tiles, which encaustic is just, it's cement that's uh, fired. Encaustic is firing. And some are glazed, some are yellow, some are, you know, they, they're hexagonal shaped or octagonal shaped with cabochons and all that kind of stuff. The parfoy, the French that I have my walls covered with in my kitchen is back in here. Some rolls of bamboo from uh, Marrakesh. In this area, I've got all shipwreck pottery. And this I just bought. And it's probably the nicest assortment of shipwreck pottery that I have come across in one fell swoop from shopping. And, you know, it, it goes from Tang Dynasty, Song Dynasty, um, there's also, it's Swan Kalat, which is uh, Thai, and Sokka Thai. And those are both Thai potteries, but they're all happening at the same time period. And the ships would go around India, they would hit Thailand, they would go to Vietnam, and then they would go to China, and then they would cross the Malacca Straits into Indonesia to trade. So your ships, these are small ships and they would be laden with stuff that they picked up in all these different countries and they're trading at every port that they went to. And so on one ship, you'll find stuff from like five different countries. And that's sort of why it has this kind of mix of stuff to it. But the, the shapes and patinas are really fabulous. They're, they're really lovely. Here, I like to keep my lighting and behind it is sort of like general bases, pedestals, you know, stands, side tables, uh, stools, kind of cool wooden things, more stools on this side. Chandeliers are bopping around this way and that way. Those are the smaller jars. These are like the bigger jars, which is more of the Cretan jars. Mm, there's some Peloponnesian jars. Um, floor lamps, you never, it's hard to find a good lamp, so we always have lots of floor lamps. And here, these are, these are again old um, windows that um, I salvaged and kind of just made doors out of them. But, and it's the same in the carpet room. They were just, they're just windows that I was like trying to say. Here's another lychee tree. I'm fond of these like lychee trees, except this one's hollow and it doesn't weigh nearly as much. Um, and all the, the raffia are hanging lights um, that I had made in Marrakesh. And they're just, they're like, they're like really cool. The light that comes through them is really wonderful. And as a collection in a group, they're, they're pretty wonderful. They're, they're kind of nice. They just have, they're beautifully done, they're beautifully made. I mean, it's raffia that's been like twisted and I don't know, I'm not sure how people do those things. We love pots and jars. We have all this green stuff, it's from Borneo. And it's just, it's a great color. It goes from like blue to green and it's got a little bit of purple like dripping in it. And, and here, 
Um, these are French. So you kind of see this sort of like, they're very, very similar and glaze and all that kind of stuff. And the, the English used to do green glazes as well on their, on their pottery for plates and things like that, except they made their glaze with arsenic. And the people, the ceramicists, wouldn't live past like the age of 25. So they, um, that's why you don't find as much. My greatest find in here is the barn itself. <laughs> you know, but, you know, I, I buy a lot of stuff, obviously, you can, you can tell. And my greatest find is going to be very different from someone else's find. That's why I don't. That's why I let people poke around in here on their own accord, because it, for them, it's their discovery. I refer to the barn as Aladdin's cave, because if someone's looking for something, I can usually produce it or a relative. Um, but the barn itself is what gives me the greatest pleasure. And, and finding it and being able to purchase it and um, living next to it and saving it, that's that's the real gift and this the barn swallows have just left they just migrated back to south america and they're these beautiful lovely little birds and they're endangered because of loss of habitat and they build these little nests and they're you know they're up on the eaves and they build them out of like straw and mud and they have their broods of birds in here and they teach them to fly inside of the barn before they'll take them outside. So the mother's giving them like little flying lessons and she'll take them upstairs and they're flying around in there. And they, they do go to the bathroom on all of the merchandise. And I really don't care because I really love, I love the barn swallows. And early August, mid August, they, they just start massing and then they're gone. And and that's what they did, and now it's quiet in here, and I sort of like miss all their chatter, and they're like swooping in and out, and their, their sort of busyness. But it's nice to be able to share my world with them, because I feel it's, this is, they were here before I was, and they, and they always come back. So that's good. So this is the upstairs. This was a loft. This was filled with hay. And when I bought it, it had about three to four feet of rotted hay up here. There was holes in the roof. There's a big hole here. That's why I put the staircase here. It's because the floors were already rotted. So the building inspector why, asked why I needed such large staircase. And the guy that was helping me said that I hire a lot of um, ladies. So they need a double wide staircase to haul the furniture up and down, <laughs> which wasn't exactly true, but um, anyway, this now is, it took 300 gallons of paint to paint this um, because it just soaked it up and soaked it up and soaked it up. Um, but it's a little like being a, in a cathedral in some kind of funny way or in the inside some of a ship that's turned upside down just because of the shape of the roof. And up here I have a lot of, um, this is the Dutch colonial furniture that I buy in Indonesia. And I, I love these benches. I find them the most comfortable benches. I use them on terraces. I use them on porches. I use them on screen porches. I use them in houses. They're just, they're, they're very versatile. And then there's a giant pile of Tuareg carpets. And they come, basically the Tuaregs are in, um, Mauritania and they go all the way to Algeria. They're in, that, they're in the Sahara and they're sort of nomads. And the carpets are leather and straw and they're, they're just beautifully made and beautifully done. And they're sort of modern, but tribally and great color. You know, they're, they're sort of straw colored and leather and they're, they're interesting patterns. They're um, been using a lot of those recently. And this is where I keep big tables and medium tables. Um, there's Spanish ones, Portuguese ones, there's French ones, there, you know. Um, but if I'm looking for a table, this is where I'll come. 
behind the tables we've got upholstered furniture i buy that in france they're all like 19th early 20th century um very comfortable slightly small scale which is nice for an apartment and since we're outside of manhattan there's a lot of people in city apartments that need sort of small scale the the painted panels it's a 16th century ceiling from genoa in italy which i think is pretty wonderful i don't don't know exactly how to use it yet but i'll figure it out um in here i keep my case pieces we've got you know cabinets with shelves french this is 19th century french it's a little faux bois we can you know buffet storage coffee tables and console tables english big cabinets this is sort of uh, these are out of uh, uh jakarta and it's like mid-century modern but i think it's just a useful sort of um way of organizing it this is the english it's called a coffer 17th century you keep all your your goods in there um this is the round table section stools coffee tables um from all over um and then beds giant frames more stuff uh, you know there's you never know when you're going to need something so my advice for decorating um i would say just buy what you love buy what makes you happy and and if you just do that you're you it becomes consistent because you have a consistent taste and then it all kind of works together it doesn't matter you know how old it is or where it came from or whatever but it, it just kind of it'll like mesh together sometimes if you know if something doesn't work the way it is if you just change the color you can get it to work um but i say have fun i say you know enjoy yourself don't be afraid of it and if you don't like it you can just change it it's it's an easy it should be an enjoyable process it should be a pleasant process it should be a rewarding process it should be something that brings you joy and there isn't any right way or wrong way of doing it you should just do it do it and be happy Well, how were they? That was fun. Thank you for coming, and I've got to go back to work, so we'll see you later. Today on Homeworthy, we're taking you to London for a look inside antique dealer Miranda Utridge's enchanting 19th century terrace home. As founder of the tabletop brand Maison Fet AC, Miranda has a keen eye for sourcing one-of-a-kind decor. Her eclectic style, enriched by collected items, creates a warm and inviting atmosphere that delightfully blends everyday elegance with historical sophistication. Enjoy! You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. Hi Homeworthy, my name is Miranda Utrich. We're here in London. Welcome to my home. Come on in. Hi, I'm Miranda, founder of Maison Fête, and welcome to my home here in Battersea. Uh, we found this place a little over a year ago. It's a 19th century terrace kind of cottage house, 
um, and built in an estate uh, that was originally built for artisans and workers with schools, recreation, um, and a lot of community-focused um, buildings. And we are lucky enough to be joined by our family dogs, Georgina and Ophelia. Um, they are on a little vacay in London right now. <laughs> so welcome, I can't wait to show you around um, and let's get started. So this is my living space and one of my favorite things about this space is the original Victorian fireplace and tiles. I wanted this space to feel super cozy and warm. One of my favorite pieces that I own is this tapestry here. It was actually one of the first kind of big purchases I made when I became an antique dealer. Um, and it's been in every house that I've lived in since I bought it. Um, and I found it with my mum in France, actually. So it was a pretty kind of proud moment to buy my first tapestry piece. A lot of what I buy is antiques and secondhand furniture, and I'm a big DIY person as well. You can see some of the molding in this space downstairs is uh, was put in by my partner and I just to add a little bit more of a historical touch and aspect to the house. So because I specialize in antique tableware sourcing and selling, I do collect a lot of it for myself and I find that it makes for the best home decor. I also love collecting old books and as you can see I've got um, on these shelves here along with some antique plates and some creamware pieces that I love to put out on display. This was a piece that I also found in France um, where I get most of my antiques from. I actually found this cupboard separately and, and paired the two together to create a bit of a vignette here. And I love kind of blue and white um, porcelain and ceramics, as you can see. And I also got these lovely um, fox gloves from my neighbor's garden. She was very kind to let me have some for today. So I've got quite a few little art pieces that I've just collected from markets and brocantes over the years that I like to kind of layer and place throughout the house. Anything from etchings to um, oil paintings. I like to make a lot of my own lampshades, um, actually, from old fabric that I have. I've done this one here, and I love this indigo and the birds and this little ruffle moment. And my friend Holly from Fleur London gave me some flowers for today as well. She's a florist. I would say that my style is probably old and eclectic. I've got a lot of um, antique pieces that I love, but I don't seem to hone in on um, any specific era or time period. As you'll see in the dining room, I'm a big fan of blue and white porcelain and ceramics. I also love creamware ceramics as well. So anything that has kind of those deep, rich antique blues and greens, like the tapestries, I'm quite drawn to those kind of colors. I love collecting books that will inspire my tables and styling. Um, this one my mother actually just gave me, Martha Stewart, which is a classic. So whenever I've got an event to style or I'm going to host a dinner party, I'll always have a quick look through some of these books to get some inspiration. This is actually a little DIY project. My partner wanted something that he can put his feet up on when we're watching movies. So being such a small space, I wanted something that I could kind of tuck to the side and then pop out when he wanted to put his feet up. So I just took some fabric and reupholstered this little vintage bench. So this mirror my mum gave me as a Christmas present a few years ago, um, and it's an 18th century mirror, and it's one of my favorite pieces. And I actually got it before we moved in here, but thankfully it was the perfect size to go above the mantle and kind of become the centerpiece of the room. And coming off the living room is our dining room, and it's... When we first walked into this place of over a year ago, I knew that uh, it was for us just because of 
the amount of space that we had compared to the old flat that we were in where everything was kind of jammed into one room. I love that this house has an open plan, but everything still feels uh, quite cozy. We got this dining table, we went with round and it actually extends. So when we have um, guests over, we can extend it and host more people. I've got uh, another tapestry piece here, which I found in France. We put up molding in this space as well. I really love that this dining space has these built-in shelves here, which we created a little kind of bar area. So when we have friends over, we can have drinks. So we've got that set up here. And then you'll see my collection of 18th century Chinese export porcelain, which I do use sometimes, um, but most of the time it is on these shelves. We've got a little porcelain lamp here, blue and white to match the rest of the blue and white that's going on on the shelves. I've got this beautiful English silver tray that I found at an antique shop just down the road actually. And this piece of art I really love. It's a um, 1950s charcoal drawing of you know, a teapot, a terrine, a champagne flute. So just more tableware inspired decor. So I find a lot of these pieces when I'm traveling for work. I founded a company called Maison Fet and I source and style antique tableware, which is available to purchase through our website online. And we also do event styling and photography styling. I started Maison Fet three years ago in the hopes to teach people the joys of dining with antique tableware pieces and to elevate their everyday dining. So it's amazing now. We've just started doing a lot of workshops now between France and London, which is super great to meet my clients and customers and teach them hands-on how to set a table, how to work with antique pieces, and how to arrange florals. I've spent quite a few years now collecting antiques in London um, and in France, but I'm actually not from here. I am from Dallas, Texas. I've been in London for five years now, and before that I was in Australia, in Sydney, for eight years, uh, where I studied interior design. And I came to London at and took a job working uh, in event design. Uh, my brother was living here and my family um, was part-time in France, so I wanted to be a little bit closer to everyone here. I picked up this chandelier here at a market just outside of London called Kempton and found the lampshades online to go with it. I love what it's done for the dining space because as you can see, the whole house was only came with overhead lighting. So I wanted to add a lighting uh, feature in here. So like everything else in this house, I got this console table from a market that was here in London and it fit perfectly on this little wall to complete our dining space. And I use the bottom half of it is storage for my copious amounts of plates um, and tableware and crockery that I collect. And then I have some of my other favorite pieces, some gilded bronze candle holders and some really beautiful 18th century cutlery that I put on display because I love to look at it every day. This is the original box that it came in and it's actually made of fish skin, which is quite interesting instead of leather. These are just little pieces that I've picked up over the years, just loved for, for no particular reason. I don't know, they just spoke to me. Um, this is actually one of my favorite plates. It's all hand painted. Um, and I'm so sad that there's only one of them that I've discovered. That's why it's up on the wall. <laughs> so next we have the kitchen and it's just through here. Here we are in my kitchen and this is one of my favorite spaces for entertaining because we have this big um, bar here. I love the wooden countertops and the first thing that I did when we moved into this space before unpacking a single box was 
putting up wallpaper in here just to give it a little bit of uh, character. I chose this beautiful pale green floral trellis wallpaper um, which makes it feel like a little English cottage um, in here. Um, we spend a lot of time in the kitchen. Uh, both my partner and I love to cook. Um, we're cooking every day. So I would say this is the most used space. So like with any rental house, there are always a few things that you would like to change that you can't. Although I do love this kitchen, the cabinets aren't my favorite color ever, but I find that with the wallpaper that I chose, it kind of offsets the brightness of them. There's really no more space in this house. I think every cabinet and every cupboard and every closet is full of tableware pieces. So as you can see, I even have baskets and um, ceramic bowls on top of my cabinets here. So I have my collection of antique chopping boards here, which come in handy for summer dining um, and eating out in the garden. My other favorite part of the kitchen is this window here that looks out to our garden. I've got all my herbs in the windowsill. This is my favorite wall of the house, I think. I've got my china cabinet here um, where I keep some of my favorite and most special antique tableware pieces. But first I'll show you these wonderful little sconces that um, I picked up at a market in France and they've got this beautiful little floral detail and I've paired them with these embroidered artwork pieces here of flower bouquets tied with ribbon. We've got our extra dining chairs on either side of the cabinet for when we have dinner parties. And each of them are these beautiful tapestry pillows in this green velvet that I really love. On top of the cabinet, I have a collection of uh, embossed terracotta pots. These are, I think, are just so fun. And you'll see actually out in the garden how much I really love antique terracotta pots um, by how many I have. Um, but these ones are quite special and they're all a little bit different. I especially love this one here with the trellis design. This gorgeous blue and white terrine, which you can see has been repaired and stapled and most people would probably turn away from a piece that's been damaged, but to me, it just goes to show how much someone loved it. They loved it so much that even when it broke, they took the time to repair it. Um, and it just, it really speaks through the piece. Um, so it's on, on display there. And then if you open the cabinet, the first thing you see is my collection of Annie goblets. So this is a goblet that I designed myself for Maison Fête um, and it's based off of um, the Georgian green petite goblet. As you can see here in the 18th century when they were made, they were made to be very small because someone was always filling up your glass. Um, and my mum had a collection of these um, antique goblets and we love them so much, but we could never use them at dinner parties because you couldn't really drink from them two sips and you were done. So I made it uh, my mission to recreate them in a larger scale, but keep as much of the original shape and integrity of their original characteristic as possible. Um, and then I named it after my mother. So this is the Annie Goblet. So I also have a um, collection of 18th century porcelain plates. Um, I have this beautiful green border and floral design, which kind of lays the backdrop of our hutch. So you can also see um, a small collection of antique cutlery pieces here. Back then, everyone used to bring their own cutlery with them to dinner parties, and it was kind of a status symbol. So. They were really ornate and often beaded or hand carved or decorated in gold and jewels. Um, and so these are a few pieces that I've found over the years that are just absolutely beautiful. And I just find it so interesting that 
um, people used to be so conscious of the pieces that they ate dinner with every night and how different it is now. And then this pair of glasses I actually bought myself as a birthday present a few years ago. Um, and these are 18th century hand engraved. This space is obviously the main transition out um, into the garden. And I wanted to keep it quite open because it also has the uh, opening into the kitchen. So a lot of the times, you know, we're entertaining in this space, but I knew I wanted to put my china cabinet here with all of my favorite pieces. So that was kind of the main focus. So next I'd love to show you our garden. So come with me. So we're super lucky that it's summer now in London, an actual summer, not raining summer. I love to garden. I love spending time out in the garden. I love working with my hands. So I've done quite a lot to this garden since we moved in. Um, there were a few things, but a lot of it I planted myself. So I'll take you, I'll just show you around a little bit. We've got some beautiful climbing hydrangea and jasmine that I'm hoping eventually will kind of cover this window um, around this window here and frame that quite nicely. And then over here is my little potting station. I have quite the collection of antique terracotta pots. I do end up using all of them. It's kind of like on a rotation, but I just, I absolutely love them. And I especially love the, the smaller ones, which are great for um, little herbs or um, seedlings. So I don't quite know how this happened, but our parsley has gone insane and it's uh, kind of taken over this corner of the garden. We also have a little bit of apple mint here that I've planted. Um, and yes, we, we now use a lot of parsley um, when we cook. These haven't bloomed yet, but these are Japanese anemones, which they'll come in later in the year. And we've got um, a little garden bench here, which I, this is one of my favorite spots to come and sit and also Ophelia's favorite spot. The thing I love most about this home, I think is definitely the garden. Um, when it's warm and sunny, we spend most of our time out here. We'll eat breakfast out here. Um, we'll have dinner out here. Um, my partner is South African, so we have a lot of brides out here uh, during the summer. It's so nice to be outside and to have this kind of garden space in London is such a treat. This is actually a basket that I found on the side of the road and decided to plant raspberries and strawberries in, um, in it. And this strawberry plant is going on like three years strong now, which is, and is quite huge. Um, and then I've got um, some sweet peas that I only planted about a month ago that have just gone absolutely crazy. And then a few more hydrangeas because I love hydrangeas. So like I said, we dine outside a lot during the warmer months and I'm always setting a table like I have today. Um, we've got some beautiful peonies, which are in season at the moment and the inspiration for this table. I love the different shades of, of pink. Um, and so I've used some of my um, antique pink and white porcelain china for the plates and just on some nice white linen and we also have our annie goblet but in the new clear version which um, just came out last month these chairs came from my parents house in france and they're wonderful they fold up but they're very much just kind of like french garden bistro chairs and they've really come in handy this summer. I couldn't only have tableware decor inside, I had to bring it outside as well. So I've got this um, blue and white um, Rouen style platter that I've kind of popped on the wall here. And you're so lucky to see the jasmine in bloom at the moment. Um, it completely surrounds the entire garden and it just smells amazing this time of year. So let's head back inside. I'd love to show you more of the house. 
So this is the primary bedroom and when we first moved in, uh, this room was painted this kind of baby blue grey colour and I tried really hard to decorate it for a few months and was just not having um, the best of luck with the pieces that I already had. So we asked the landlords if we could paint actually both of the bedrooms and luckily they said yes. So we went with um, this color which is Travertine Mid by Little Green Company and it's made the room feel so much warmer, so much more cozy and we're just, we're so happy with it. So this room also has really great built-ins um, with the shelves and side tables on either side of the bed and a full wall of wardrobes on the other side, which is really hard to find in London. So that was quite a win. So the headboard and the lamp shades, I made myself from some tapestry style fabric that I had. Like I said, I like to make my own lamp shades. Um, and I thought it'd be really fun to match them to the headboard and the deep blues and greens and kind of golden tones from the fabric paired really well with this paint color. So I was very happy about that. And that's kind of the theme for the rest of the room, this kind of dark blue um, that you see in this accent pillow here and in the curtains. Um, and even through the painting above the bed and some of the porcelain pieces, more tableware pieces that I have on the shelves here. So on this side of the room, we have two big windows that uh, look out onto our street. And I've put up these um, curtains here in this dark blue and um, kind of cream shade that match the colorway of the room. Okay, so now I'll show you the guest room. So this is our guest bedroom and I wanted this room to be super inviting and really cozy. So we went with uh, this beautiful green stone paint, again by Little Green Company. Green is my favorite color as well, so um, I really loved this room. One thing I love about this room is the exposed brick wall and the fireplace. Um, it's the only room in the house that has exposed brick and I just love how it makes this room feel like it's in a English countryside cottage. So there is a bit of a theme to this room that I think just kind of happened naturally, but it's very floral themed, which I love flowers as well, so I'm not opposed to it. I found this collection of vintage floral etching prints on Facebook Marketplace actually, and thought they would go perfectly in here above the bed. Still, of course, have a few tableware pieces, a lovely um, antique porcelain floral plates. So this mirror I found at a market in France when, when I was with my mum, actually. And it was one of those pieces where it literally stopped me in my tracks. It was raining and um, we were actually on our way out of the market and everyone kind of started packing up. And I saw this mirror uh, leaning against a table on the floor and it was getting soaked as well. But I just fell in love with it. It's got this beautiful kind of old, what used to be velvet, gold velvet. And then these hand embroidered um, bees on them. Now the actual mirror itself isn't old, um, but, or the, the wooden frame, within it, but the this fabric with these bees, I want to say is quite old, possibly even 17th century. Um, so being the floral garden themed room, the bee mirror had to go here. So I found this Georgian cabinet online and I knew I wanted a larger piece of furniture in here because it was going to be the only piece of furniture in here. And I just absolutely love the craftsmanship on this piece and how it almost makes the room feel bigger because it is so big. And the great thing about it, a desk as well. Home to me is making lifelong memories with family and friends. Thank you so much for coming to visit Homeworthy. Until next time, bye.
On today's episode of Homeworthy, we're visiting Pleasant Ridge, Michigan to explore the beautiful home and gardens of Brad Stanwick and Matt Anstett. As the founder of the Parsons Nose Antiques, Brad's passion for art history, which he studied in college, and his love for antique English furnishings have shaped their home's unique style. This passion allowed Brad to leave the corporate world and follow his dream full time. Enjoy! You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Before today's episode, click the join button below to support all of the storytelling we do on this channel. Our growing community of members help to directly fund more videos so we can capture these extraordinary homes from around the world. So join today to receive early and exclusive access to new Homeworthy videos. Hey Homeworthy, I'm Brad. And I'm Matt. Welcome to our home in Pleasant Ridge, Michigan. We'd love to show you around. Hi, my name is Brad Stanwick, and uh, I own the Parsons Knows Antiques, which is an uh, uh, English antique importer. And I'm Matt Anstett. I was a research scientist for about 30 years until I recently joined Brad to help him with uh, the antique business. So we're in Pleasant Ridge, Michigan, which is a really small city just north of Detroit. And our house is uh, a California bungalow. And when, when was it built? It was built in 1912. We did a bunch of research and found actually an article in, in the Detroit Free Press from 1912 showing the house selling uh, for about $5,000. And this was sort of a community of, um, uh, to get away from the city, so it was a lot of cottages, and really this was the country. We're about 15 miles from Detroit. I would describe our style <laughs> as sort of um, really antique. We have a lot of period oak, antique mahogany, some pine, all English. We did this renovation, I think, how many years ago now? Oh, God, maybe. Probably 15. five years ago. We bought the house in 2003, but uh, one of the first things we did was the, the backyard, uh, which we'll see shortly. But um, we're really excited to do this kitchen renovation. This hearth room here was not actually here it was a sliding glass door outside so this even though it hopefully looks like it's been here for a while this is a brand new room with a brand new fireplace we put in a full wood burning fireplace which was really important to us and then we have the wood storage underneath there as well um, and a lot of the the windows you see here were all um, made in an old uh, on an old machine instrument in um, missouri by uh, the weston millworks they did all the old glass, individual panes to match the original windows. And this kitchen, it was sort of like a Brady Bunch kitchen when we bought it. It was uh, not really done uh, very well. And uh, you had the avocado ovens and, you know, we lived with that for quite a while till uh, we were able to do this uh, renovation. And we love, uh, love to cook and entertain. Yeah, we wanted a space to be able to sit and relax. And this is where we have our coffees, usually in the morning uh, with our dogs. And we're able to kind of look outside and see the garden, which is really nice and kind of get cozy by the fire. Of course, we've been waiting to announce the dog names. This is Clementine. Uh, this is Miss Eleanor. And uh, they're Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. So really everything you see in the hearth room is from us, the Parsons Nose. The chandelier is a German chandelier, Black Forest. This uh, dining table is uh, English, uh, pine, and it uh, expands so we can uh, set a few more people around it if we need to. These are old uh, Windsor chairs from England that are surprisingly comfortable and we do tend to use and abuse them and we really love them. The paintings, we, you may notice a theme of, of horse paintings. I've been told that I've cornered the market on them, but uh, we love the look. Also, we're really interested in Chinese porcelains as well. So you'll, you'll see those all over the house. As far as inspiration goes, for me, I've always been sort of an Anglophile. My background's in art history with a minor in decorative arts. It sort of has been a natural thing for me to start doing, importing. Um, and uh, I was in the IT world for about, uh, I don't know, 23 years, uh, which was great. Um, 
but uh, in 2019, I was able to, to leave uh, the IT world and start uh, doing the Parsons nose full time. This is a little, what I call a Lake District table, and it's one leaf, opens up, just when you need a little bit of extra room. Uh, and uh, I, I, it's, a, it's old oak, so uh, you'll see that as a theme kind of throughout the house. So these I purchased in, in England at an auction house in the countryside. And we really try to light all of our artwork because it adds so much to the room. And then that's a little duck head that's actually from Denmark. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look at the rest of the kitchen. It was really important for us to have a good size island. Um, it was intended to look like it was built from old pine. And this is Carrera marble on top, which definitely gets etched, but we sort of like that patina and we love using the kitchen. So you'll notice the range and the cupboards over there that, that there's scratches and dents and dings, but we do a lot of entertaining and a lot of cooking, so. Now, when we first had it installed, we were worried about little scratches and chips and things like that. But over time, our friends and family came and destroyed everything. So, uh, <laughs> and we did too. It's the best kitchen for us and we really love it. We went from having kind of the worst kitchen to having our dream kitchen. So. Yeah, absolutely. And then one of the funny things about the kitchen is there's no upper cabinets. What we did instead was over one of these pine dressers where we keep all of our dishes and bowls. So we really don't have any uppers and we reuse this every day. And when the dishwasher is done running, we, we put all the dishes and then when we serve, we grab them all. Uh, but it's really handy and uh, we really love it. And it's sort of enabled, I think, a different look than when you have uppers. We also did these copper pots here, which yes, we do use. Maybe not as often as we use the stainless steel, but we definitely use them. And some of them are rather old. They have really beautiful iron handles. We love the warm look of them and have enjoyed collecting them. And polishing. <laughs> Uh, we also had a lot of the hardware here you see for the shelf and, and the hanging made by uh, local craftsmen. So we, we often find people that are local that can do some unique things uh, like this. And, and also we had some of these things like this push button gangplank here done uh, you know, by our um, the same craftsman. And he stamped out the different uh, areas that these push buttons, which we put in, um, you know, at, uh, light up. Um, this this kind of came from inspiration from, we, we tour a lot of the local uh, mansions, the Ford homes. So these large Tudor homes that uh, Edsel Ford and Henry Ford, uh, you know, had built back in the day. Uh, and one of the things we saw in one of the houses was this really long <laughs> push button uh, light switch uh, panel. So we kind of took inspiration from that and some of the other, you know, designers. We worked with the designer, John Rattray. He owns Craig Hall Interiors. And so while, you know, we sourced really all of the antiques um, and we sourced, um, you know, all of those types of things, you know, John did a, a number of things for us around space planning, electrical plans, style of the light fixtures, the plan for what the tile would look like. For example, we're not particularly good with fabric, I have to say, um, but John's brilliant and he chose anything that you see that's fabric in here. He chose really all the paint colors as well. And a lot of detail on the space planning to optimize the square footage that we have. It's about a 2,800 square foot house. So this is just the way it was laid out. The way he laid this out really is an open kitchen space, which is great. And I think that's one of the things that you forget that you need is space planning. So, um, you know, I'm kind of a furniture guy, if you can tell. And so I just kind of want to cram furniture everywhere. But John really sort of restrained me and made sure that we were doing the right thing with the space and in really the right look. So kudos to John and really we couldn't have done it without him. Now we'd love to show you the dining room. And on the way, you can see the, uh, the bar that we installed with the beer taps. I did a lot of engineering to uh, have a full size fridge, uh, a bar fridge in the basement and cave, uh, lines that come up to these, uh, these two taps. Um, of course, they're, uh, they're empty because it can be very dangerous to have any uh, kegs of beer uh, on hand uh, for very long. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the other things we did was we put a second dishwasher in here, which uh, really has saved our lives many times, um, especially during a party. 
So um, I think one of the things that I would definitely suggest doing would be having two dishwashers. So um, you can see it's kind of right here. It's John did a really good job, and there's some dishes in there. Uh, but John did a really good job planning um, the and look of the kitchen. The fridge. Uh, and there's the fridge, yeah. Bar <laughs> fridge. Uh, so come on into the dining room next. So when we bought the house, this room was actually uh, wallpapered it in was Paisley. A, it was a Waverly, <laughs> an old Waverly Paisley print. And uh, none, there was no paneling, and these beams up here were all painted white. So we spent some painstaking time scraping and sanding and staining the, the box beams. Uh, and when we took the wallpaper out, we found a pattern underneath on the plaster of paneling that had been here at one point. So we had our carpenter match the form and uh, create the, a paneled room, uh, basically restoring what was here originally. You'll see a lot of portrait paintings and they're definitely members of our family. Right, Matt? This uh, table is one that we brought over from England and it's really an old oak uh, farmhouse table. It's a little cupped, so when we're sitting in, it goes a little bit higher. Uh, the plates are a little bit higher than maybe you'd like, but it's super charming and it's exactly the right size for here. So uh, we just really love this table. Um, this is a really old sideboard here. It's got two large Chinese vases on. This one was actually completely rebuilt because when it came from the Netherlands, it was shattered. So, um, so we, we had our, our restorer put that back together. Actually, John from Craig Hall did this arrangement of old English pewter plates. If you go to England, a lot of the country houses uh, have, have pewter plates like this. And so we, we took some inspiration uh, from there. Uh, this is a California Impressionist painting. It's pretty moody, but we really love it because it's got such great greens, and green's a big color that yeah. we both really love. Um, and again, we have it lit because every painting looks better when it's, uh, when it's lit. Another thing, interesting thing about this, the, the chairs around this table is uh, these were all slightly different because they were originally made for members of a family, so depending on their size, they had the chairs built to, to match. So that you'll see that there's sort of some shorter and some wider than others. When we first walked in, um, we had to look beyond really years and years of, of um, sort of upgrades, right? So 1970s, 1960s upgrades. So there were a lot of louver panel doors. There was a drop ceiling. There were... Um, painted wood. Lot all of the wood was painted. A lot of mauve carpet. But, you know, we walked into this house and we actually really loved it. Uh, as soon as we walked in, and I guess we've always had the ability problem of having some vision around homes. So we absolutely loved it. We felt right at home right away, and uh, we were super excited to get the house. It had a really warm feeling to it, and uh, you know, for as old as the house is, it had a very modern feel as well in terms mm -hmm. of the openness. Um, the only problem was we, we were a little bit nervous about all the, the work that we were going to have to do. Uh, to get it up to, <laughs> up to and, snuff. And, and we're still stuff. doing it. <laughs> yeah. I think our carpenter came through and he said, uh, I'm going to be working for the rest of my life on this house. Until he retires, <laughs> which maybe he's close to doing, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I think what we tried to do was to kind of bring it back to where it was, so like the paneling that was put back in and stripping the wood and staining it, trying to give it that uh, original look, get mm -hmm. rid of anything that was vinyl or or aluminum or, or plastic, um, you know, 60s, 70s stuff, uh, and get rid of all that um, and ch kind of bring it back to more of a, a natural look. Well, it's an arts and crafts house, right? So it's a, it's a, a, a bungalow. Um, and, and maybe the natural thing to do would have been to do arts and crafts, but um, obviously that's not really me. My interest is in English uh, antiques, so it really kind of obviously fits well together. Okay, we'd love to show you the primary bedroom, so follow us. Okay, so this is our primary bedroom. Um, when we bought the house, this was one of the pink rooms with the pink car carpet, I think. And pink walls and it had painted light, uh, light yeah. green wood. So we, we... Pink and green. Yeah, so nice. we made some pretty big changes <laughs> throughout here, but... Um, you know, one of the things that I love is the, sort of this collection of uh, antique Chinese blue and white porcelain, which is something that I am very interested in right now. 
And then this bed is pretty interesting, right? Because we had it made in England. So it looks antique. It's made out of oak. And we actually had sent this bowl and said that we really wanted uh, this bed to be this color. So um, the guys over in England, I think, did a great job matching it. Uh, and uh, we're super pleased with it. I just want the Scrooge curtains for this. <laughs> but. Yeah, so this is a, an old English court cupboard made out of oak. And on top, I've got uh, Chinese blue and white porcelain that I've been collecting for a few years now. So you can see different sizes of vases. Um, this one is a particularly old one. Um, it's an old cash po. Uh, and um, I just love the quality of the porcelain and the look of the blue and white. I think it's just beautiful. We love the different horns and antlers from deer. It sort of uh, follows along a, a really distinct culture around hunting in England. And uh, they decorate a lot of their homes with, with uh, the antlers. And so we, we've done the same thing. Yeah. When we go to England, we go to some of these uh, uh, manor homes like Haddon Hall, uh, which is very much a, was a hunting lodge at one point in its history and so very wood wood uh, oak and antlers mm. and very cool so we go to england about once or twice a year and really we kind of head to the north of england and uh, one of the th our favorite things to do is to visit the country houses so places like chatsworth haddon hall that matt had mentioned earlier um and uh we we love going through the houses we love seeing the kitchens in particular i think um, but also get inspired by all of the, the furniture that's that's so beautiful and, and all over the place yeah. and all those houses. And they also have a lot of a lot of gardens mm -hmm. and of course the history of the whole the whole country. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've made friends there, so we do visit with them and and tour around um, and uh, do some of the pubs. These are English oak chairs that we brought over from England, and uh, John chose the fabric on the chairs uh, and it's sort of another neutral that kind of blends in well with uh, with everything in the house I think the walls mm -hmm. and also these beautiful velvet curtains that John chose as well so this is some more example of us working with a designer and and probably never being able to make that decision at least uh, either one of us actually this is our Japanese maple that you'll see shortly from around our patio and back and so these are just uh, some uh, branches from it that we brought in and put in a um, a blue and white uh, antique Chinese porcelain vase <laughs> I should point out something kind of funny about this uh, tall boy as we <laughs> We sort of have lost the, uh, the screw that goes on that, so we're working on trying to, uh, to find that. But also, um, we're kind of okay with some of the quirkiness of furniture and age and things that happen to it over time because uh, it just sort of makes it real and, and gives it a sense of history. We, we mm. sort of like to, like to see that every once in a while. You'll also see lots of marks or rings or um, you know uh, maybe chunks of wood missing. And to us, that's all part of part of the, the the process of owning antiques and part of the history of each piece. Home, I guess, is, is some place where you feel safe, secure, and comfortable, and uh, it has a warm feeling. And you just—it's a place you always want to return to when mm -hmm. you're out traveling. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's a nice. It's a cozy place, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's also a sanctuary, right? It's a place to kind of unwind and to really surround yourself with the memories and some of the things that you that you that you appreciate. So let's go into the primary bathroom. Why don't you follow me? So on the way to the bathroom, we have this little and also another chance for some art and furniture. This was the study, which was just filled with a lot of Brad's things, collections. And we uh, eventually were able to put in uh, a master bath uh, and um, some of the, the features, we have uh, two different vanities here. This uh, stone here is Nero Portero marble, which our designer found. Um, it's a, you see it in a lot of old buildings in Detroit, really a pretty unique marble. Brad also found a table that we had cut in half, uh, and that's, those two halves serve as the base for both vanity. I, I don't know how old, how old is the... 
table? They're, old. they're old, like 18th century English oak. It was a single table that we had cut in half, like Matt said. There was no top left. So uh, that sort of was an okay sign for me to actually cut them in half because it would be very painful for me to cut something that was in, in, good in good shape in half. So, um, so, so there was sort of a perfect thing to do. Um, I should say also, you know, John, our designer, really pushed to make this uh, our primary bath from the study and um, I was very resistant at first uh, because I didn't want to lose a place for more furniture, my books, more art, but um, honestly he said that you'll use this more than any other room in the house and he abs was absolutely right about this. So I'm so pleased uh, that we did this and really he perfectly centered the shower so that you can look out the window into the garden um, and uh, it's, it's really a beautiful view in the morning. We, we absolutely love it. I think one of the most beautiful things about this bathroom is the wall paneling. And John designed the placement of every single panel in here. The color is really beautiful. It's Benjamin Moore ancient ivory. Um, and so we really painted everything. Uh, the the, the uh, primary closet is that color as well. John also laid out the floor. This is really just your typical landscape outdoor bluestone. Um, but it makes a really beautiful, very durable floor. It's heated, so uh, in the, in the wintertime it's really cozy in here. The other thing that we did was we used some actual picture frame to go around this mirror, which is medicine cabinet. And uh, that was a really fun thing to, 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 to pick out. There's also a picture light above the medicine cabinets, which really give a nice soft glow and kind of just the perfect down light. Um, so I think you always think you look, you look great. <laughs> we kind of went back and forth over what we wanted to do with this shower, but ended up um, really deciding to just do marble throughout. Um, there's some nice cubbies in there. The floor is heated in the shower as well, which really helps to dry it. And um, when you're stepping on it, it actually is never cold, which is kind of nice too. There's also another sort of gang of switches here in unlacquered brass that we had made, and they're, they're listed, and maybe you can't see it that well, but um, John's very big on electrical plans, which I never really thought about until we were doing this renovation, but um, you know, he's got dimmers in all the right places. When you leave a room, you can actually turn off anything that you didn't turn off uh, when you were in the room, which I think is a great, a great feature. And the heated towel. Ah, uh, yeah, the heated the towel bar we to have here, uh, which is unlacquered brass, which at the time was impossible to find. It's not so much about having a warm towel to dry yourself, but it also just dries the towel quicker so they actually stay fresher over time, which I think is a really cool thing. Now we'd love to show you our patio. Follow us. So now we'll take you on a tour of our garden. Uh, I think probably the first and one of the things we're excited to show is actually this uh, climbing rose on the back of the house. Um, it's called John Davis and it's an English, your, sort of your typical English rose. It's absolutely covered in flowers when it blooms. It only blooms once though, which is sort of the downside, but it's very worth it to us because uh, the spring show is so spectacular. So then over here is our pond. So when I talk about the value that John brought to the design of the back, as we were thinking something much smaller, but he really wanted to do this 16 foot long pond. It's uh, four feet deep on one end and three feet on the other. So the fish do stay out all winter long and they just sort of hang out. There's probably about 15 fish and there's a few really large ones about uh, two feet long. We've named the, those fish. Milo. <laughs> That's the orange and, and white one. And then Jefferson is uh, uh, orange and white uh, and black, and he's, he's big too. And then this is one of our perennial borders that uh, originally we had a hydrangea back here, and we did that as per our plan. But then Matt and I are really more kind of plantsmen, so we love the individual plants and we love really all plants. So we took out the hydrangea and put in a perennial bed here, um, which, uh, which we've been weeding and tending to for, for a number of years now. <laughs> One of the things about the pond, we actually did all the engineering and design of the water flow, which goes out that end and into the basement to a uh, commercial filtration system, a, a bubble bead filter that 
Brad did some research on, uh, and then the, the water then comes back through this end, um, so it keeps a continuous uh, movement and filtration and, and, and healthy water quality. You'll notice there's three pink roses in here. We saw them at the nursery, and our favorite nursery is Telly's uh, in Troy, and um, we didn't, there wasn't a name for them, so we, we went ahead and bought them anyhow because they had such a beautiful pink flower on them. Um, and we call it the Matty Rose after Matt because he was the one who actually picked it out. And it's proven to be absolutely beautiful and blooms tremendously kind of all summer long. And I really wish I knew the name of it. So if anyone out there knows it, I'd love uh, to. I like the name. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things we did uh, was plant a lot of boxwood, as you can see. I don't know, there's probably hundreds of them here. They were very, very tiny uh, when we bought them. Uh, now they've grown and we also planted these um, Alaskan weeping cedars, which have gotten really, really big. We did clear a lot of uh, kind of the, the brush that was here and, uh, and put in a lot of the stuff ourselves. The view that we wanted though from the, the bedroom was really out at these Alaskan weeping cedars because they just have such a sort of romantic look to them. We planted a lot of peonies. This is about the only one that is still blooming. So it's kind of time for us to take all the old peonies out and put something in that'll be a little bit happier. So this is a big olive oil pot that we actually just put in here about a week ago. We were looking for sort of just the right thing that was just the right size and came across this in England. So I'm super excited to have it uh, have it here. I think it, it adds a lot to the, uh, the, really the end of the pond, which, you know, it's important when you're gardening and when you're designing landscape to have uh, focal points uh, and, and a place to, to go to and we've tried to do that here. We've made this also into a perennial border uh, where we sort of put in peonies, roses, um, there's garden flocks, um, there's uh, uh, asters and then also some, uh, some sort of uh, natural uh, uh, native plants across the back including joe pie and uh, cup flower, um, but we, we punctuated the, the beds with these uh, viridus yews, which are these upright yews that grow kind of in this very beautiful sculptural shape. One of the other things that we love is nature. Uh, we love backyard birds and one of the best things to do to bring birds in, to put in bird baths because water is super important to the birds. We also sort of did a little copper pipe off one of our drip hoses so when that zone runs, it also fills the bird bath up. So uh, that helps kind of keep it, uh, keep it uh, filled. We also, to, to avoid mosquitoes, we have these little uh, all natural um, uh, mosquito bio uh, thingies. We put this yew hedge in to kind of stop the view but also to have a background of green in order to um, show off our geraniums um, and then we had a little uh, opening spot made so that we can put up. So this is a little bit of a sort of a secret area um, where we've got uh, ferns and trillium. We planted hemlock uh, really early on in our, our the work here. Um, and so uh, it's a very green and very cool space uh, that we really love. Yeah, we've tried to plant some uh, Japanese ferns and also uh, these are trillium, which is a Michigan wildflower that grows up uh, in, all, in the woods in Michigan. So we put a bunch of them under here to see if we can get them. To sort of continue on with the yew hedge, we are letting this section on each side grow so we can uh, do an archway, uh, sort of a living uh, uh, archway over, over each entryway here and, and on that. So this is our patio. So this is where we do a lot of our summer entertaining and have cookouts. These are Japanese maple trees that are the ones that we cut some to go into that vase in the primary bedroom. And these are really, they grow like weeds. <laughs> so we're constantly having to prune them, but they, they have a really open, airy, and beautiful feel to it, to them. And um, they're really the right choice, I think, for, for our patio, we, we absolutely love them. And they turn a really great orange in, uh, beautiful color in, in the, the autumn time. Yeah. So, so that's sort of an added bonus. Yeah. This is my bell. Oh. So this is a restoration hardware table that I don't think is made anymore, but it has um, its teak and it's got a, a, Ch a Chippendale fretwork back. John, our designer, really pushed for us to grab it. When we saw it, 
because he for some reason knew that it was going to stop being made and it's really the perfect set for out here. And one thing I started to collect are um, these citrus trees. But these are uh, bear's lime. Uh, a friend of mine in California had them growing crazy so I had to go online and find them and see if I could grow them here in Michigan. They've been in uh, our sunroom over the winter and we got some limes for gin and tonic. All right, this has been a lot of fun, but it's actually time to go to work. So why don't we head over to the Parsons Nose Warehouse? Welcome to the Parsons Nose Antiques. Uh, this is our warehouse, and I'd like to take you on a, a tour. And this is our big warehouse that we unload the containers because we bring everything over from England in 20 foot uh, or 40 foot containers. And we do about 10 a year. Um, we don't have a retail shop yet, um, so everything we sell, we sell online uh, through Instagram. Uh, we're quite active on Instagram, and we have a, a great website. So let's uh, take this tour. So you'll notice um, a lot of furniture in rows and um, different uh, configurations. Um, we have this section over here where items that we've sold are leaving to go to different parts of the country. So once something uh, gets photographed and is online and sells, we move it into here, uh, waiting for our uh, teams. This is one of my favorite pieces we have right now. It's uh, a bow front chest of drawers. It's made out of mahogany. Um, and it's unusual because it's pretty big. It's got uh, really nice black handles. Uh, big generous drawers which is always nice, bone es escutcheons, uh, and a kind of a really cool shaped apron down in the front. I've always been uh, a, a collector of antiques, of furniture, of paintings, and um, I got started because uh, I'm such an Anglophile uh, and I wanted to start importing uh, English antiques and make them, making them available to the uh, to everybody in general. But the thing that I knew I wanted to do was to do it all online. So we go over to England about two, three times a year and uh, source all of these um, amazing pieces that we bring back. Um, and we're really, uh, really excited about where the business is going. Uh, I've said that we don't have a shop yet, but uh, we are planning on opening a shop in Charlevoix, Michigan sometime this summer. So this big piece on the wall is a French barrel back uh, housekeeper's cupboard. So um, it's, I don't know, probably what, nine feet tall, uh, but I really love it. Uh, it's got a really beautiful color uh, pine. Um, and let's see if we can get the doors open. It's always a little dangerous, never knowing exactly what's in there but I think it's a pretty impressive piece. Uh, I really like that. And also these rhubarb forcers, which are pretty interesting because what you do is you place it over the rhubarb as it's starting to grow. And um, it, uh, the plant reaches for the light and in the meantime, creates very long and uh, somewhat pale uh, stalks that are, are, have uh, more, more flavor and are really more tender and easier to cook with. So rhubarb forcers. So one of my other favorite pieces is this painted blue pine linen press. Um, it's got, let's see if I can get it open, shelves up on the top, which are really useful, and then drawers, uh, whoop, a little loose, <laughs> but drawers on the bottom half. So, and I think the color is just really, really cool. It's kind of like a, I don't know, a really light blue, right? Yeah. Uh, I was going to say robin's egg, but not quite. And some of the other detail, I mean, the, the, the grain on these knobs and then this inlay, you just don't get that on newer pieces of no. furniture. Another piece I think is pretty cool is this ebonized pine English chest of drawers. I just love the color. I think it's kind of, black's kind of a neutral right sometimes, and it's got beautiful wear. Um, and it's just a really useful piece of furniture. We sell a lot of chest of drawers. Um, this one probably not so much for a changing table, but we do sell a lot of them for changing tables uh, for nurseries. So it's always a good piece to have. So this is a different warehouse. It's the first warehouse we got. Actually, the, the second, the warehouse that we were just in or the warehouse next door is uh, our second warehouse. Um, but this one 
has um, a few special things about it. It's got our uh, photograph wall. So this is the wall that we take all of our photographs against, uh, as, uh, as well as the rug. So if you follow me on Instagram, you'll probably be very uh, familiar, very comfortable with, uh, with uh, what you're seeing here. But, um, you know, we only usually show enough to, to show off the piece of furniture, but you get to see everything kind of uh, behind the scenes here. So this is a, what we call a Welsh dresser. Usually Americans call a chest of drawers a dresser, uh, but in England they don't. They call this piece of furniture a dresser. Um, and it was intended to be in your kitchen or maybe in your, your cottage dining room. Uh, and if you remember our kitchen, we have one uh, as well but uh, it holds a ton of uh, plates, a ton of mugs, and anything else you might need. And I love this one because of the color. It's a really pretty sort of bleached pine almost, although it's not been bleached, it's really light. And then uh, I'm just a sucker for these big chunky knobs uh, on all the furniture, I just love it. This is the workshop area that uh, we repair anything that maybe had a little trouble coming uh, over the pond from England. Um, really everything gets waxed, um, maybe uh, touched up a little bit with paint perhaps, um, but this is really an important part of really being an antique dealer uh, because you're also a furniture repairman. Uh, uh, that's just kind of how it is. All right, so this is my actual office and if uh, you follow me on Instagram, this is often where I'm sitting posting are creating the reels and trying to do something interesting for both you and me. Um, but uh, I love this office because it's filled with pine and um, my house is all dark oak, so it's a nice change. Um, this French birdcage against the wall here, uh, I really love. Um, and it's uh, got just a great look to it. Um, and also I love this uh, pine cabinet, which I put a lot of the, my books in and some some antiques and um, other pieces. And then this is kind of my messy desk where, where I sit uh, and spend a lot of my time. Thanks for watching. Go to homeworthy.com for exclusive content and shopping guides.